Okay. Okay, I'm here with Thomas Wynn. Welcome, Thomas, to my channel. Uh, for those of you who have followed my channel for the last year or so, Thomas Wynn should be no uh, should be no stranger. Uh, we've had uh, conversations before. Most recently, uh, Thomas helped in preparation for the course on Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Uh, he was a part of um, the Nietzsche Dialogues and also an Ask Me Anything About Nietzsche as well with Lehman Pascal, which is uh, worth checking out. And um, so you guys know a little bit of background on Thomas. Thomas is a doctoral candidate with a specialization in both Nietzsche and Heidegger, and has an, also an interest in more contemporary philosophers like Gianni Vatimo and Slavoj Žižek. And mm -hmm. uh, Thomas will actually be teaching in the upcoming or rather ongoing philosophy portal course on the science of logic. Um, and his class will be specifically focused on Heidegger's Hegel, so I thought it would be interesting and necessary as well to both include uh, Thomas in the logic dialogues um, and also in the logic of the course itself. I mean, I think a Heideggerian perspective on Hegel is 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 always worth engaging with, uh, considering that Heidegger, um, as a philosopher in his own right, had such a tremendous influence on how we interpret Hegel. Uh, and so here the logic is once students go through the course on the science of logic, it will be interesting after a deep dive into Hegel um, to sort of get mm. that, that perspective on how Heidegger read him. Um, and and no, no better person to do it than um, Thomas. So welcome, Thomas. And um, how are how you doing today? <laughs> very good. I'm very good today. Not yet. It's, um, it's always nice to talk with you. The two, three times we've spoken, the Dust Spokes Artistry Conference, the course. Yeah, so no, it's good. All good today. Um, yeah, good. It's earlier here, so I'm just still in that mode of waking up. Yeah, just waking up. Uh, just no, I'm, I'm pleased being... to be here. This is, it's a trip for me to be speaking about something which actually has become one of the most interesting aspects of my philosophical journey in terms of reading through the history of philosophy like Heidegger's Hegel says something very unique and very it's a very particular interpretation that's really provoking me to reconsider um, how Hegel fits into not just the history of philosophy but how he really is an overlap in his move to absolute knowledge with Heidegger even if Heidegger doesn't like to admit it from what I've I keep discovering in some ways. Um, uh, generally, I'm good, and I'm really happy to be here to talk about this, especially in preparation for the logic, in both yeah. senses of the logic of your of your course, but also the logic that Heidegger himself tackles. He he does tackle it actually. Hmm. Maybe he it's misses the tackle, so but he still tackles, you know. So, so I mean, maybe maybe let's let's start start off start off slow. When I, when I say when I say Heidegger's Hegel, um, mm -hmm. what what comes? What's the first thing that comes to your mind as someone with a background and and a sort of uh, mm -hmm. being influenced by both thinkers? Um, for me, then it's always and this is the this is the niceness of Heidegger in some way. It's very obscure, but it's a, it's always the way in which he frames his reading of Western philosophy is. The history of the question of being so for heidegger what centralizes his, his whole entire project from like the 1912 period through to being and time through to the later turning in his work what's central to his whole perspective is the question of being so in every time that he reads the history of philosophy he more in the early years he's de destructuring like the word deconstruction comes from this heideggerian motif of like reading the history of western philosophy in order to understand how what he calls being like what we all call being in some way has been concealed in its kind of potential event for us so he would say what's interesting about the history of western philosophy is that um something happens kind of in the socratic period where our understanding of being shifts from a phenomenological experience which then already you can see the connection between hegel the phenomenological experience of being as uh, disclosure, unconcealment, as presence, 
in this Greek period, there was something which happens, which changes being and the way that we would even think about the question of being. Um, so the way basically Heidegger reads, his, reads the history of Western philosophy is how has this philosopher um, in an obvious way or in obvious way read being or understood being or placed being as a presupposition, as something which grounds the rest, you know. So he would say, and this is maybe the immediate connection that he brings with Hegel, is he not only says that any thinking has to tackle Hegel, but any thinking that thinks the history of Western philosophy has to see how Hegel and Nietzsche are those philosophers which bring being to its most metaphysical form, in the sense that at that point we can see how it destructures itself. And that's where Heidegger starts in a way. He starts in that period where he says, now today, because of the tendency of modern thought, we have an opportunity in the danger of technology, in the danger of like objectifying thought to glimpse being again, but not being as an object or being as a thing, but the experience of phenomena which presents itself to us in a way. So basically just, yeah, Heidegger's, Heidegger's whole project and the way that he places Hegel is to read him through that lens, you know, the question of being. Like how does Hegel introduce being into his own system? And this is then interesting because the logic is the question of being, nothing, becoming. Um, hopefully that was clear in that sense because it's really central. Like, and this is this is the the easiness of Heidegger in a sense that you can understand how he frames his reading in that way. But then it's kind of that the, the tackle with Heidegger is to understand how he himself interprets being as something different from the history itself, you know? Like, what is it about being that enables him to read it as not being an object or not being a thing, but as being a possible experience in um, existence that is, um, what's the word he would use in being on time? uh like ecstatic it's ecstatic in the sense that it overwhelms your preconceptions of what is it's that thing which is no thing which you know <laughs> it moves it becomes it it presents and you know but even this this is heidegger's uh, problematic which he then moves on from being in time is like you can't even use the word is you can't even presuppose it you know like the the word is always like connotates this idea that we can um, predicate something about it. We can describe it, you know, we can propose its status. So this is the problem. He, he understands that there's a potential disclosure of being, but he understands that in the way that we in Western philosophy have, have thought being, it conceals itself. And this is like the, the thing, like if, if me as a being thinks being, already there's a, a seeming disconnect, a disparity, a gap. And already maybe if anyone knows Hegel, they can already see how the phenomenology starts from that perspective of like, in my everyday thinking, the way I think about things is as if they are immediate, but not in the sense of like, phenomenologically immediate, but in the sense of like, I think I can just know it, subject, subject object, mediated, you know. Whereas Heidegger is more interested to say, well, what does Hegel say about absolute consciousness, true consciousness, which enables him to experience the phenomena of beings so that the truth itself becomes phenomena. And that's, that's in that sense, very, yeah. But, it, but maybe bring me back a bit because I'm just kind of flying after two or three weeks no, of no, just no, reading. No. It's very no, no, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, there's many themes there that I'm picking up if I'm trying to pull it together. There's this idea, you know, and it's, you know, it, it, it's quite common, you know, when I read philosophers is like their perspective on the Socratic period. You know, mm. do they view the Socratic period as um, a type of sublation or an advance or do they view the Socratic period as concealing something? Yeah. Uh, that, that, like a, de that a degradation. Now... A degradation, right. Like Nietzsche's words that he would use, yeah. 
a degradation, right? Something, something that's that's something we've lost. Something that mm-hmm. was was perhaps present in a pre-Socratic mode of thought, which is now con- concealed, no longer disclosed to us uh, in, in a normal, in a in in, in the sense that we think of in in philosophical terms. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that this something which is concealed seems to have something to do with ecstasy something to do with um a form of 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 experience which perhaps uh is surprising or disorienting or disjointing or um Mm -hmm. uh dislocating Mm -hmm. um is is interesting because you know one of the first things that is is often pointed out by uh, young hegelians after the sort of hegelian um you know system was introduced and dialectical method was introduced and 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 hegel's influence had grown to uh to 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 prominence in at the uh, peak of the idealist movement is this contradiction um in hegel from the perspective of the young hegelians of um, a, a sort of dialectical method which allows us to approach the dynamic development of being or reality. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hegel's system, which is often read as something totalizing and something which um, presents some ready-made logic uh, from which there's no more development in view. So, mm-hmm. you know, in this, in this first reaction to Hegel, um, as on the one hand, someone allowing us to move with being as a becoming in a dynamic way uh, with a method in hand you know Mm -hmm. hegel himself in the logic says you know that the dialectical method is the one true method and things like that and allows us to approach the flux of becoming Mm -hmm. on the other hand we have let's say a, a system of categories you know which um are often seen as uh um non-developmental or or as mm. as static as rigid as as a monstrous concept that was um, the word in my mind monstrous yeah a monstrous concept so <laughs> so, so so from mm. that perspective what do you think's going on here in the initial tension mm. and the initial reaction to to hegel and and his 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 appearance mm-hmm. no that's the best way to frame actually like for a long period three four years of being interested in postmodern philosophy it literally started from that critique um and so what you just said there relates to actually there's um a journal article by Slavoj Žižek on Hegel versus Heidegger that's literally the title of the journal article and it starts from that same link linked in the description linked in the description and um so basically this journal article from Žižek says exactly the same line and exactly the same problem was noticed by young Hegelians, but also then post Heideggerian thinkers. So a lot of like 20th century, 21st century, even readers of Heidegger would critique Hegel. And this is a lot of people, a lot of philosophers that I'm interested would not touch Hegel because of this exact point. Like it seems like his whole dynamic towards even approaching being in the Heideggerian sense is done through a system of thinking, which, assumes that it can know absolutely and for a lot of people today that the very idea of absoluteness absolute certainty absolute knowledge even spirit these categories these forms these ways of speaking about experience seem to be pre-modern you know in that precise sense like he seems like to be this like word even the word total the totalizing system so the postmodern critique would be, well, how can you tell me what is total when it's my interpretation? But actually, what's very interesting about Hegel and, and I think this is a very important point to make, Heidegger's reading of Hegel as well, is that the phenomenology is a precise tackling of this problem in respect to absoluteness. Because what Hegel's talking about is, yes, when I think about the object in front of me, Yes, it's my interpretation. Yes, it's mediated. If you try and find truth in that object by itself, the in itself in a way. So Heidegger's reading in, um, he wrote a very, very nice text I would recommend called Hegel's Concept of Experience. Um, He wrote this in 1943, which is a very interesting period in Heidegger's philosophy because he wrote, um, there's there's a book called Hegel, 
which are which is um basically two sections of notes from like 1941 no 1939 to 1941 then he wrote the text hegel's concept of experience in 1943 and even in those few years difference you can see how heidegger really recognizes that hegel's system is total in the sense that it brings you back to a type of presencing of what's present so what's total about it is that you become aware that if there is any truth or certainty or absoluteness it's not an abstract ideal categorical totality or a system it's a system which brings you back to the absoluteness of your own consciousness you know so this is the text hegel's uh, concept of experience experience is the word he uses for beingness this is heidegger's interpretation Ex or the reality of the real is not some kind of true perspective that you might gain if you know the correct system of thinking it's literally a skepsis a thoroughgoing skepticism to where you always already are which is the place of absoluteness like the absolute is present with us and this is why uh, this is and this i think this could actually theme today's conversation because even working through hegel um heidegger also wrote the text in his early years called like um hegel's phenomenology phenomenology of spirit what's most interesting is this period where like in 43 44 heidegger really starts to show his awareness that what is monstrous what is totalizing is only monstrous because it brings us through skepsis to beingness to the absoluteness of consciousness and like this is the power that heidegger sees in hegel's phenomenology leading towards the logic is that we can represent our own presence in the sense that we can think the fact that we are here we are conscious like we are being so what he says with hegel hegel does in moving from everyday consciousness or natural consciousness towards what he then would call like true knowledge or true consciousness these are heidegger's ways of speaking about hegel there's a move there which is not like a move to the system of truth a move to the monstrous abstract world of you know categories again if any categories are introduced any forms it's always to bring you back through skepsis to beingness but instead of saying beingness which is an important category for heidegger he would say subjectness so hegel uses the term like you have the subject you have your idea of yourself but what's absolute is your subjectness meaning the fact that you are being that there's a continuation there's a becoming to your being you know there's a movement of being that you are and so self-consciousness in heidegger's reading of hegel is a skepsis a skepticism which brings you back to phenomenal knowledge knowledge of phenomena as what is true but the interesting part with hegel is he's very confident about the fact that you can have a concept of it like you can think presence and that's the truth yeah. of a being yeah, yeah yeah it's intelligible intelligible whereas most postmodern yeah. thinkers would say no like that's yeah. my interpretation i can't reach the yeah. in itself of an object anymore yeah. the object failed me i have to just despair in the symbolic order of you know spectral this kind of stuff which i'm interested in what's yeah. interesting about hegel is the fact and heidegger this is the exact same thing mm. in that critique of everyday consciousness for hegel and the day for heidegger from being in time they're critiquing a quality of knowing which fails to reach an object but rather than just stopping there both heidegger and hegel the reason why they're still kind of modern is they think there's a different quality of being or becoming or a different quality of literally knowing because because it's a heidegger does a really nice job of saying that what consciousness means is seeing but also knowing so literally consciousness is the mode of seeing and knowing what happens in both rather than just saying oh what i see and what i know fails because the object disappears or it dies or it moves away i can see and know the very fact that i am seeing and i am knowing like the descartes move you know like i think therefore i am or i am thinking well, there, there is a there is a certainty here exactly the absolute and, and, certainty and of what's happening yeah. 
And this is there is a certain it's here. It's not, but the, it's it's it, there's. It was really interesting, you know, to go through in depth um, some of the forewords to the science of logic because one mm. of the things that they try to stress in the foreword, some of the um, commentaries on on the book, is to emphasize that Hegel's project here is only deceptively pre-Kantian. It's not actually pre-Kantian, obviously. It fully accepts the Kantian break, the a priori, the transcendental correlationism, all that, mm -hmm. all that stuff, which is so crucial to ide the idealist movement. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there is a, a, a certainty not of external content. You know, as you're saying, there's a skepticism towards mm. uh, external content. There's a way in which Hegel seems to resonate very strongly with the skeptics and in the phenomenology also there's um this move from skepticism to which something which i don't think has a proper term but something like contradictoriness of mm. content conceptual content exactly yeah but at the same time that 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 con contradictoriness of conceptual content is seen in its positive aspect meaning that mm. it's going to move you towards a new quality, a new way of knowing, a new way of experiencing, like you're, you're pointing out. Shape, so there's this, a new shape of consciousness. Yes, a new and shape of true. consciousness, yeah. And, 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 you know, he states this in many ways, sort of emphasizing the primacy on, you know, the, 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 that the negative or the contradictoriness is not mm. um, something which brings you to a null result. Mm -hmm. Like it's not exactly. bringing you to uh, a meaningless Neither. result. Mm. right to nihilism right it's not bringing you to nihilism it's actually a movement through nihilism is perhaps part of the movement but it's there's a positive aspect to the nihil to the to the to the, to the nila and 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 hegel says that this is actually difficult for ordinary consciousness to understand you know mm -hmm. so so in that sense you know i feel like perhaps the monstrous conception of Hegel is actually actually a, an image or a concept which emerges from the perspective of ordinary consciousness. Exactly. A, a, yeah. You know, after, after, anyway, so in any Heidegger case, would say this. Heidegger okay. says this as well. Sure. So, okay. We're on the same page then. That's cool. So, <laughs> so in regards to, in regards to, let's say, 20th century interpretations of Hegel, Heidegger here stands as a, a towering, a towering figure. And of course, Heidegger, you know, if I was to name, you know, who's the most influential philosopher in the 20th century, you know, the names that come to me immediately are Deleuze, Foucault, Heidegger. And then, you know, if we're talking about the pinnacle, the peak of the peak, you know, you maybe you, if you include Nietzsche, as a 20th century mm -hmm. philosopher, you, but you know, you know, but really yeah. the list is 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 this is the the, the peak here. So, mm -hmm. so in regards to Heidegger, what you know, one thing that stands out in regards to this difference between you know Hegel's dynamic dialectic approach to the movement of phenomena and our capacity to sublate phenomena, and Heidegger's emphasis on a type of um, future-oriented temporality, that the condition of our being human is its mm. future-orientedness, that we are, we are mm. that the sort of our, our basic orientation of, let's say, transcendental finitude. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in that sense, where do, you, where do you think Heidegger starts to um, differentiate himself from Hegel, or where do you see him as mm. continuing Hegel's project of, a sort of dynamic sublation and 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 a sort of a methodological mediation. Mm -hmm. You know, is there um, room in, is there room in Heidegger for for methodological mediation, sublation, and, mm -hmm. and these categories? Oh yeah, the word annihilating is central to being in time. What is metaphysics and the rest, all the way through to his later seminars, like annihilating as a way to understand. Uh, the what not only what what he thinks is happening annihilation, but what that means for thinking like what is thinking? It's always revolving around this annihilation, this undoing, this movement. In being in time, it's towards the future. It's projection. So what always problematizes our conceptions of what the world is, who am I, is the future. The future is always that which undoes, because we see death, finitude. 
and we see becoming in some sense, even though he wouldn't use this word specifically. Um, but just just to go back to even like the connection here that would then help understand like the differentiation. The connection is that both Hegel, in my opinion, and in Heidegger's reading of Hegel as well, and himself in that sense, both move from a type of consciousness, even if Heidegger wouldn't use this word because it's too modern. It presupposes the subject too much for him, but still, like there's there's a there's a differentiation in the quality of our possible existence, basically compared to the everydayness, compared to the way that we see the world, the way we encounter objects, there's a different possibility of thinking the world where in all of the failures we can guarantee absoluteness. And that's the point back to what's actually happening phenomenologically, you know? And the very fact that we encounter ourselves as that which is happening. So both of them have this central move that then helps differentiate themselves because the question is, Sorry, it's just a bit loud. For for like, so in Heidegger's reading, like, what is it for Hegel that we arrive to? You know, like, what do we encounter when we move from false consciousness? It's just literally an awareness of what is happening. But yet, the 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 bridge between the two is how do they how do they get there? How do they approach it? You know, and I think from my personal opinion, before and even now, because of reading the last few weeks just very intensely with Heidegger. That Hegel's trying to understand his period more, you know, idealism. He's trying to work through these conceptions of how it is that we can guarantee the conditions of knowledge, like, you know. But he would say we're looking in the wrong place if we think we can guarantee it in the being that we're looking at, in the truth that we're looking at. Absoluteness always needs to come from itself, in that sense, the itself. But the only itself for Hegel is. The absolute but what is the absolute <laughs> it's the concept of absoluteness what's absoluteness it's beingness it's happening it's movement it's becoming it's you know but he has a system to get there in some way and by the way i'm, I'm speaking from heidegger's interpretation of more of the phenomenology of spirit because actually when heidegger approaches the logic he then starts to introduce criticisms concerning the system which brings us to beingness so he would say, yeah, Hegel does bring us to beingness. He just calls it experience or consciousness. He brings us to the absoluteness of that beingness, what goes on of itself. But the way he gets there, especially in the logic, it still carries with it certain presuppositions that remain questionless. So like, for example, the text Hegel by Heidegger, it's about the questionlessness of negativity in Hegel's work. So Hegel would say from one shape of consciousness to, to the next, there is this skepsis, a thoroughgoing skepticism that brings you through this kind of passage towards what seems to be null or void. But then he's able to move on from this because he says like, ah, what you're calling nothingness is itself determinate. So actually, we, instead of using the word nothingness, we can use negation. And that moves us on to the next quality. So he doesn't stop where postmodern people stop. He says, ah, if you recognize that your idea of nothingness also belongs to natural consciousness, meaning you're trying to find the truth of nothing as if it's in itself a thing, you need to undo this. It's a thoroughgoing skepticism towards a different quality. So basically at that point, but then so like this negativity moves us towards the different quality, the same as Heidegger, because in, so rather than using the word negation or sublation i know like alex said but like we'll speak about this he would use annihilation as like what con constantly brings you back to presence or to absoluteness but heidegger would say what's left questionless in hegel's idea of negativity is how how is that negativity happening why you know because for, for heidegger if you think negativity more you can actually think being because being is that which is annihilating. Whereas in Hegel's system or Hegel's work, he presupposes like a pre-creation view in some sense, you know, like where he doesn't have to talk about negativity because there still is a truth about being in that sense, like in, in the sense of like beings, like how we relate to each other, how we move in the world. Um, so like the beginning of, what's the text? 
the beginning of the second section of Hegel, um, Heidegger says that Hegel presupposes that we can understand the world from before it was created, you know. And for him, this is still too metaphysical in the sense that it avoids the radicality of what he calls annihilation. Because if you think that you can understand what is before it is, you're taking a distance from it, you know. Like you're, you're, oh, I think I feel like I'm not explaining this well. Like you're. No, 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 it's fine. I think the, what where I, where I, like this, mm. so where where I, where I would want to jump in here is just an interesting point I think is is this idea that Hegel presupposes that we can understand the world from which before it was created. So he says mm. explicitly in the science of logic mm -hmm. that when he talks he does talk about being able to stand into a position as if we in this way in in the way mm -hmm. in which we can stand into the world before it was created. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't mean this, and he says explicitly, he doesn't mean this in a physical sense. Mm -hmm. He means this in a conceptual sense, kind of yeah. like concept qua concept. So it's like you're, mm -hmm. you're, it's kind of like the move from, you know, identifying with a system of concepts to sort of realizing that you are the concept which can create systems of concepts. Yeah. It's like that. It's just, it's, it's a meta mm -hmm. perspective on the, on the concept, which gives you sort of that that space or that capacity mm -hmm. to to sublate or to annihilate yeah. um, or, 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 or something like that. Now, it seems like when we think about the way Heidegger is interpreting Hegel, it mm -hmm. seems like like what's what's clear to me in studying Hegel is the importance of the concept of negativity. It's it's throughout the phenomenology. It's throughout mm -hmm. the logic. You know, there are always these experiences when you're reading Hegel where you feel like you're being brought to something positive that you can identify with. And you're like, and, you know, and he's stringing you along with the logical chain. And it's like and you're and, and inside your head, you're reading and you're following along and, and you get to the, this mo this moment of the concept where you're like, that's it. He got it. That's the thing. But then immediately he says no. You know, immediately he drops the thing and moves on to another. <laughs> moves on to the other. Moves on to another thing. So there's there's always this way in which he's training you to undermine mm -hmm. the way in which your logical machinery is unfolding or mm -hmm. mediating itself, and then and then letting it go, and then training you to get used to that, used to that process. Now, it seems to me in what you're saying that in Heidegger he's saying that there's a deeper a deeper level of negativity which mm. needs to be thought independently of subjectivity that hegel's thinking about negativity as a work of the subject so exactly. for example in phenomenology there's a work of the subject as it relates mm. to its images mm -hmm. of an external object which it could get certainty from yeah. And then in the logic, you know, once you've sort of overcome that you you are the object, you are the certainty mm -hmm. uh, that, that that's the only certainty you're going to get. There is going to be no external certainty. Then mm -hmm. you can actually think as a sort of mode of negation, a sort of annihilation. Mm -hmm. And that there's a certain um, negativity implicit in you working through the main concepts would be being essence and concept. So the, you, in your working through being essence and concept, you're sort of prepared as it were to know that you are the type of thing or the type of being, being type of, you know, if we don't want to use the word subject, the type of subject mm -hmm. that can uh, engage in such a thought process. Mm -hmm. So, I'd be interested, you know, what is, um, you know, what is here Heidegger's negativity that needs to be thought independent of a subject? Is that the right yeah. way to frame it? A negativity yeah. thought independent of a subject? Exactly. And yeah, that's the, and as you've said this, you've really helped frame what I was messily trying to say before, because that is actually the... And I think the kind of the confusion at the moment around this is that in each text of Heidegger, he really does seem to say different things concerning Hegel. But I think this is Heidegger style in some sense, because Heidegger does want to follow the thought. So it kind of sounds like he's affirming it, you know? 
So he's always passing through this affirmation of like, so the Hegel's concept of experience up until the end is a pure affirmation of what we arrive to. And he says the absolute for the subject is being for Dasein. So there's like this affirmation of being. But in the other texts, he works with this problem problematic of saying um, the way he Hegel approaches subjectivity and what he arrives at, which is the subject as object, as certainty, as absoluteness, reminded him of his work in being and time, which in his later work he sees as being too focused on that sign, being too focused on the subject's own kind of overcoming so that it can see what is, like what Hegel would call the reality of the real, you know? Like it puts too much emphasis on the fact that what is, is to be seen and known by consciousness, by the subject. But I think with Heidegger's negativity, which he would not call negativity because he would call it annihilation because he wants to really get to this kind of ongoingness of it in a way. Um, like the phenomena of it, not the beinghood, he would say. Um, and did it, I just quick, just quickly to make sure I, I get this get this right, is you're saying that Heidegger sees being and time as mm -hmm. the mistake of being and time as too focused mm -hmm. on Dasein as similar to what Hegel's doing in the phenomenology of spirit? Yep. Okay. Yeah, just wanted to make sure I got that right. Like in the sense that it's not a dialectic, it's a differencing. So he would use the word difference a lot, like the finitude. And we have to then like gain an authentic relation to what is, which is the finitude, time. So like following Kant's idea of the imagination and its connection to time, which is what Heidegger reads from Kant. The whole project of being in time is to say, well, I need to see that I am a being there. I am a das sign in the sense that I'm being in a temporality, which is <laughs> always problematizing my like everyday consciousness, you know? So what problematizes my knowing is the fact that I'm approaching death. I am, all of my determinations are temporal, you know? Because what he arrives at, he wants to arrive at something which is other or certain or absolute actually which for him is being because what is being is being it's just how we thinking it that conceals it you know but, but so basically from this move from being in time yeah. what he says and it kind of goes back to my interest in some way and it's obviously my projection and it's in my notes it's really a theme that keeps coming up is the move from being in time is just and to, to even what is metaphysics which is like the following essay like even in this few year period he recognizes how it's not about gaining the correct ontological perspective about being. It's not about knowing the truth of being in the sense of meaning. So he moves away from the question of the meaning of being, which is being and time, like significance or place, to the unconcealment. So he would then say, okay, rather than me looking at the meaning of being, I want to look at the way in which being seems to unconceal itself in the sense that I become more aware of what's present as presenting, what's being and it's beingness. So beingness now becomes a word. So like the question is more like, how do I relate to this? And he accepts that actually it's not about my comportment. It's not about my shape of consciousness. It's when I let that idea go, when I overcome metaphysics in that sense of trying to get the correct interpretation, that actually I, I've realized that beingness is already happening. <laughs> so being is always already here. It's just concealed in the sense that we try to know it. And, and this is the most interesting aspect of the last few weeks, and it now connects to Hegel in the concept of Hegel's concept of experience, the inversion of consciousness towards the truth of consciousness is literally a recognition of the fact that we are already conscious. Whereas being a time, and then the way that in his text Hegel, he reads Hegel's negativity, he would say, no, like the way Hegel approaches consciousness is, is he can't think the radicality of negation enough. Because if he did, then he would realize he doesn't need a system, because what is absolute is always present with us. 
that this is the this is the weird dynamic of Heidegger's interpretation. In one text, he's like, yeah, the absolute is already with us. The absolute wills its exhibition for us, you know. Right. Okay. And like so it's already here, there's not much to do. There's nothing to do in that sense, mm -hmm. and we arrive at what's what's true, <laughs> being or the absolute. But I think Heidegger's critique is those aspects of what seem to be the logic which would take you mm. to kind of the correct shape or the correct relation as if it's really abstractly conceptual but then what he then would say in like hegel's concept of experience and there's another text uh text called hegel and the greeks uh, which is the later text like in 57 he would say well like and even my third supervisor frank who's a hegelian like uh, scholar researcher he would say like he would criticize heidegger to say like there's a note that heidegger sent to somebody to say like with hegel i'm just so confused you know <laughs> and you can see this in a sense but to go back to the negativity aspect he would just say like negativity is left unthought in the sense that it can't think what heidegger wants to think in so far as being is unconcealment. So that's why for him, Hegel always remains on the side of consciousness or the subject, because it's about our perspective rather than seeing what's actually happening anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, well, it's, it's super interesting to see this homology between phenomenology of spirit and being in time. Now, my first reaction is, I don't know if I'm right, but I'm just going to give you my first reaction to, to, the, to these things. I don't know if I'm right, but my first reaction is, is that I always have taught phenomenology of spirit as if it is not Hegel's own thought, mm -hmm. meaning in the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel is not giving you his philosophical position in the history of Western philosophy. It's clear mm -hmm. that he saves that for the science of logic. Mm -hmm. And what phenomenology of spirit is, so potentially the thing that Heidegger sees as the failure of his project in being in time is something presumably that Hegel's already aware of when writing the phenomenology of spirit because he's writing the phenomenology of spirit for ordinary consciousness. He's writing it for mm -hmm. Dasein. Mm -hmm. He wants mm -hmm. Dasein, he wants ordinary consciousness to read Phenomenology of Spirit so that mm -hmm. they be prepared to understand the logic. So mm -hmm. that's at least how I'm teaching it and how I'm seeing the relationship between it. Now, the next step between Hegel and Heidegger, which seems again to show another interesting connection, yep. is that Heidegger moves from being in time to what is metaphysics. Now, the question mm -hmm. of what is metaphysics for Hegel in the science of logic is metaphysics is logic. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and so this might get us to the deep difference between Heidegger and Hegel, because you're saying that Heidegger's saying of Hegel's logic, that there's something in his logic, which is, as it were, uh, would get us the correct shape, you know, presumably the absolute idea here in mm. is where the, the logic ends for us. Mm -hmm. And now that might be the case or it might not be the case. I'm not sure yet, but mm -hmm. what I'm playing with here is the possibility that with Hegel's project, moving from phenomenology to logic, and then he moves to the philosophy of right, mm -hmm. which is a political project which is not saying that we have the, it's not saying that the logic has brought us to the correct shape. He's saying that the logic has brought us to yet another standpoint from which we might engage the political real. Mm. And I think that, but I don't know if that's the correct interpretation, but that's what I'm sort of working with in my head of the, the, the logic of the unfolding of Hegel's thought. Now that mm -hmm. brings us to, it seems like the question is this negativity left on thought is that actually Hegel's bringing us to yet another certainty of the idea 
that allows us to confront, this is how I'm interpreting it, the negativity of politics. Mm -hmm. And that, exactly. and that what, what, um, you know, is as it were concealed in the immediacy of being mm -hmm. is actually nothing. Because, yep. because at, at the core being and nothing are, are, are united. Like, Hi, like, I don't know if Heidegger would agree with Hegel here, but Hegel is saying that being is nothing and nothing is being, that they can't be thought independently of each other. They have to be thought of a unity of each other. And until you, and he even says at the beginning of the science of logic, do not move deeper into the science of logic unless you know being and nothing are a unity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because then you won't get the becoming part. So, mm -hmm. so, so it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, there's the, there's always this tendency I see not I'm saying not talking here about Heidegger, but I'm talking about what I see among subjectivity. Mm -hmm. There's always this tendency to feel as though you've lost something in the past, mm -hmm. like that there's something lost, and it's always connected to joy. There's some joy, the ecstasy. There's some original. Lost some mm -hmm. some some plus some some something something ecstatic mm -hmm. which has been taken has been stolen has been concealed and you know even my mm -hmm. experience here in intimate relationships in intimate mm -hmm. relationships the other the one and the other they always think that the other has concealed some or stolen some joy from them mm -hmm. like and 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 so just that has to be thought, you know, like, like, for example, Slavoj Žižek has a joke about slips of the tongue, where he says this, this old married couple are sitting at a diner, and he means to say, pass me the salt. But what he actually says is, why did you ruin my fucking life? You know, like slip, like a, a, a slip of the a slip of the tongue, like like you you stole the other has stolen something from me. Like there's some joy that has is in that has been concealed in their being and, and stuff like that. Okay, so that's maybe a little bit of a a tangent here, but no, no, um, directly to but, the, question, the question of but being. Just, I guess I guess like my question to you would be: there's a there's a two step question I have for you. Mm -hmm. The first step of the question is. What do you make of this potential relationship between being in time and what is metaphysics being somewhat of a similar move to phenomenology of spirit and the science of logic? And what do you make of the difference in this move? And then my next question would be, what do you make of the difference between Hegel's logic bringing us to the absolute idea and potentially, in my interpretation, bringing us to the political real and Heidegger's move from what is metaphysics to saying um, that there's some still some 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 negativity of being which has been concealed and unthought. Mm -hmm. Seems like a lot is here. No, yeah, there's there's a lot there, but even the notes as you're talking, like I'm just already looking now, and it just all seems to connect because it always, and this is the centrality of a way, like the centrality of the question of negativity for both, you know, like both both in their own ways encountered this in a very unique way you know like what is nothing and how does it problematize thinking and actually just to maybe start at the um, the first question about the difference between being in time and then what is metaphysics in what is me metaphysics heidegger directly encounters this idea of being nothingness and same so in and it's nice there's a 1968 seminar he gave in france where one of the questions from the people there, like there's like six people, um, says like, ah, what is this thing that this being is nothing is the same? So then Heidegger would reference directly Hegel to say that like Hegel said they are the same. But then he would say, first of all, his idea of being is a being of the everyday consciousness. Like in the same way that Heidegger critiques our normal understanding of being as if it's just an object that you can fit into a system and do without in a way. He would say that that being is also the same being that Hegel is criticizing. It's the being of everyday consciousness. It's this idea that, oh, it's just immediate for me and I know it's there and it helps me understand the totality of everything that is, you know? So if I say like, oh, being is the will to power, the being is, 
you know, a drive, then that helps me understand that, oh, that means I have the will to power because I'm a being. So the being of beings in the everyday sense would be, and this is a crit criticism of Nietzsche in the early years, like, ah, if you say that it's just drive, then you're presupposing the status of human beings forever, and you're treating it in the same way that Heidegger would critique it, Hegel would, would critique it, because Hegel would say, yeah, but if you think you know what being is, then you haven't seen that it's also nothing. <laughs> it's the same in that sense. So you can't move with it because it seems to be null. You can't tell me the truth of being just from its immediate representation, basically. This move is exactly the same as Heidegger's in being and time and what is metaphysics. But what actually happens in what is metaphysics that actually then differentiates the two is that Heidegger would just be, he became very skeptical about his own project in terms of knowing the meaning of being even the meaning of a being which is different from the everyday being, like, oh, will to power, you know? Because he would say, well, even if I try to provide a new perspective on it that gets back to the phenomena, I'm still telling you that it is nothing. And he becomes skeptical about this is. So he says, like, so then what he does is he says, like, being hyphen, nothing hyphen, same. Because he wants to understand that the we can't, talk about being as if it's an object, as if it's a being that can be placed into a system. So what he would say is, and then he moves to Hegel in the later 1968 text where he says, well, what Hegel did understand is that what being is, is becoming. If you pass through the nothingness of being logically, conceptually, you arrive at becoming. And actually in that same way, what Heidegger arrives at, instead of using the word becoming, is annihilation. So these two words, in that sense, they both recognize from the feminology, from being in time, that what they're trying to talk about and what grounds their experience is not like a determinate nothingness or a determinate, you know, lack. It's instead a movement that's happening, a becoming. And it's exactly at that point that we can shape our consciousness differently, like in the sense that we recognize that, oh, there's not just a fundamental lack to everything. Instead, there's a, there's a gap. So um, Heidegger uses the word ontological difference, but also ontological gap, meaning that there's a gap which exists between my, my, my being, my design, and what I'm trying to reach is this excess that you've pointed to, you know? Like, oh, I need to know the excess. I need to know the the ecstatic element from the past there seems to be a gap between what you're looking at and what you're thinking so heidegger is not trying to recover being as if it's like gone somewhere and you know it's outside of ourselves or in the past or even in the future he's trying to understand being as the present of what is presenting like that which is literally just happening of itself in that sense but he would say the problem of western philosophy but also With, without the, mediation without creation because he would say if you no, presuppose sorry, me, oh. mediation ah yeah but okay this and this is his he this that's is what his I would, idea yeah. that's what i would ask is what's the relationship between heidegger's annihilation and mm -hmm. mediation because in hegel he says explicitly that nowhere in earth or in heaven is mm -hmm. there um immediacy without mediation or mediation without immediacy that immediacy mm -hmm. and mediation are always also mm -hmm. a unity yeah post most 90 95 percent of good post heideggerian philosophy that i like but i'm starting to move away from in some sense would say exactly all that all that heidegger is showing you is that interpretation goes all the way down meaning like what you what you are thinking is mediated by your own thinking you know like everything that is thought is thought by the thinker so there's mediation the thing that thinks but then this is the question and this is what heidegger brings up because and that, that is the thing like how can we think absoluteness as that which is not mediated like an unconditioned consciousness or an unconditioned das sign that's literally just unconcealed to being like you know exposed uh, hey, uh, are you saying 
Sorry, sorry. Are you saying he Heidegger is asking, can we think absoluteness that is not mediated? I think that's the that's the in a way you could say that's how he understands the thinking that we have to think today after modern yeah. philosophy, which presupposes subject object. But he also yeah. wants to break away from the cage of consciousness in a sense. Like he wants to see, and this is and like this is why he's an interesting character because yeah. in like some texts, especially in his later work, like Hegel and the Greeks. He really just affirms this non-mediated Greek way of experiencing phenomena that Hegel would criticize, you know, like immediacy. Whereas he like Heidegger himself also critiques immediacy because he would say, well, you're not aware that you are the interpreter. So the word hermeneutics means like the philosophy interpretation. The keystone philosopher is Heidegger because he talks about language. He talks about, you know, like the house of being as being always... Um, given and sent to us because shit like through language through mediation and this is why in a way there's like always an impossibility to think being because it's always on the part of the interpreter it's always on the part of that sign and then this is where annihilation comes in annihilation is what is what undoes your desire to know being as an object and it's at that moment that you encounter the the annihilating and so what annihilating does is is the happening of being and like for maybe anyone that's watched our stuff before this is where i'm interested with letting be because letting be is just a way to characterize this annihilation is what continuously but but that yeah that's a very interesting question about mediation and heidegger because he mm -hmm. and in the hegel's concept of experience where hegel because that's a very interesting text because it goes through like the first 22 sections of the feminology of spirit, the introduction. So there's like the introduction to the feminology, like the 22 sections, and then Heidegger breaks down each section according to his own interpretation. And I would say, and I will go back to it, to look at the section where Hegel talks about natural consciousness and mediation, you know? Because Heidegger there says exactly like when you think a being, I guess like if I think about myself as a human being, I'm aware that my idea of myself is a projection that is contingent and relative according to my time and space, like 21st century culture, language, mediated. But then he would say in a different quality of knowing, I'm not trying to know myself in that way. I'm not trying to seek truth in a mediated way because the truth that i want is the certainty of consciousness itself and i think maybe and this is would be interesting to hear from you like do you think that in true consciousness or absolute knowing there is mediation still or is it only mediation in relation to objects or beings because the way that heidegger reads hegel is that what absolute consciousness is is a pure unconditioned non-dichotomous concept the, the absolute concept because what you're exposed to is it, itself you, you are exposed to the in itself of experience which is absolute so this is how heidegger reads hegel and he affirms this by the way and that's why i think maybe there is this question of mediation in heidegger because he would say in the unconcealment of being there is no subject and object anymore there's um Okay, is the signal okay? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, okay. just because it froze on the center for a sec. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so he would say there is like a, a trans appropriation, but what is being as a being is just there for me, my own flow. And it kind of is unconcealed to me in some way. And of course, like interpretation and thinking is still there. But because of the quality of my thinking, I'm not trying to grab onto it. Like what Daniel from Moji Rose says, I'm not trying to like grab it like this. I'm just letting it be on my hand, you know. So my and that that that, 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 was, that was a thinking the last few weeks when I'm reading this. Like, how does Hegel relate to beings in absolute knowing? And maybe that's what the logic is in that sense. It's a it's a working through of the system of the absolute subject, yeah. Yeah. Which then goes to your thing on the politics and negativity and like thinking the political real well, this this is this is this is the this is the crucial thing so 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 i would say that there are levels to mediation or that mm -hmm. there there's different 
qualities of mediation. There's the mediation of ordinary consciousness, which is the subject object split. Mm -hmm. There is then the mediation of the concept, which is this coming, the subjects coming to know um, the, let's say the um, uh, un unconditioned non dichotomous concept, the absolute mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. But then this is where the crucial concept in, now, I don't know if this applies to Hegel or not, but this is where the crucial concept of the real comes in with psychoanalysis. Because yep. the real is not a concept or the real is not an idea. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like this. There's a way in which it could be an absolute negativity, the real. Mm -hmm. And what it requires is a mediation. It's almost like the absolute concept is necessary for the type of mediation demanded by the real of history, you mm -hmm. know, like, like, for example, I was, I was just watching last night, a um, really fantastic movie about world war one. And What's the, name? the uh, I forget the name of the movie, but <laughs> I'll try and look it up. Uh, but it's, it's a new movie. It's on Netflix. But okay. so the, 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 the point I want to get across here is cause it was just so powerful in the movie. And I just, recognized or realized while i was watching the movie it was like there's not that many great movies about world war one in the trenches because it's so horrible it's like mm -hmm. it's maybe too much you know it's like too real it's like holy sh crap man it's like mm -hmm. but like but like so in this movie there's these kids right like they're 18 years old they're like 17 years old and they have mm -hmm. this excess jouissance from the german and, and the officers riling them up to go into the trenches you know, like they're going to, it's like, you're, you know, it's for about the body of the nation and that the nation is that the individuals don't matter. It's just the nation. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, and, and they don't tell them anything about, about where they're going. They, mm -hmm. they just show them the shiny suits and the gun and like, and they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, man, we're part of a team. Be a then, hero. then, yeah, you're going to be a hero. Then mm -hmm. they get there. It's absolute devastation. Like it's ab like, as soon as they get there, like one of the main characters, dudes gets blown apart. He's like, "Oh crap!" It's like, and then they're in the then trenches, and then the main officer's like, "This is this is how they come," and like, there's just smoke all around and gun, and then the, then their their little bunker collapses, and he wakes up dazed. Everyone's dead, you know. Like, it, it's just like the absolute negativity, right? So, like, 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 so the point is, is that those kids were ordinary mm -hmm. consciousness, like they have absolutely no clue about what's going on now yeah, they were living in the everyday you know they're just everyday consciousness subject object split they don't really recognize the power of death yet mm -hmm. and then you get like the most brutal confrontation with death you get the most brutal confrontation with absolute negativity i think what mm -hmm. hegel would demand of the modern political state is mm -hmm. the absolute concept is like the absolute concept is the concept that's capable of the ethical drive in absolute negativity. Hmm. So like, for example, the officers or like the political states that are sending these kids off to their death like that. I mean, th that, and that's, that's, that's an example of, of, well, it's the highest level of unethical behavior to send these 17 or 18 year old kids off to get slaughtered with each other and stuff like this. <laughs> so I think that's the, the level at least, at the moment of my thinking is is what Hegel's trying to mm -hmm. um, point towards. There were some few other points that I wanted to wanted to get to that I really enjoyed that you brought mm -hmm. up. But like the so may, but maybe let's go from go from here because it, it connects well to this example I just gave of like let's say World War One thinking that level of confrontation with absolute negativity mm -hmm. is that specifically here entering Zizek's critique of Heidegger. I'd be interested to know your interest in or your, your response or your relation, or, or perhaps maybe we can think something new here in, in Zizek's critique of Heidegger. He says that for Hegel, there is no return to a being or an original ontological project. There is a path of despair, which is the work of negativity. Mm -hmm. But this path of despair in this work of negativity involves a shattering of both ordinary consciousness, like, like the kids, uh, the kids in uh, World War One, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And also transcendental consciousness, meaning the standard by which you judge failure. So like, for example, let's say like that this would be more the position of like the officers or the German nation or the or the or the, you know, the or the uh, English nation uh, Mm -hmm. as that that would be the transcendental sort of horizon Mm -hmm. that also gets shattered. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this double shattering of ordinary consciousness and transcendental consciousness. And that what you what you're left with here uh, for Zizek is a groundless abyss of repeated loss. So you have this groundless repeat, uh, groundless abyss of repeated loss. And my claim would be that the absolute concept is capable of this is the reality the absolute concept engages with is this groundless abyss of 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 repeated loss. And Zizek says here, this is, quote, the painful awareness that truth is non all cracked inconsistent. So that that truth doesn't have a full reality. Truth doesn't mm-hmm. have a consistent totality. Truth mm-hmm. is in itself non-all, cracked, inconsistent, and this is um, why a subject appears. Yep. So, what what thoughts come to your head here? Lots of lots and lots of different lots thoughts. Of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> lots of thoughts. Lots and lots of thoughts. Because yeah, like I think you yeah you know, and maybe those have watched the overcoming nihilism thing like Zizek's a big cornerstone of my thinking which problematizes Heidegger it problematizes Zizek himself it problematizes Hegel and it really undoes things because what I think I really 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 enjoy and maybe it's my jouissance maybe it's my (laughs) own concealment and this is uh, Zizek's critique of Heidegger what I enjoy from Heidegger and what I see in Heidegger's reading of the feminology is a kind of optimism which looks beyond what seems to be absolute negativity in the sense that we would understand lack in psychoanalysis, like the real, which is outside of the symbolic or the imaginary. Um, because I think this, and this is again my, my postmodern interest is to say, well, surely our idea of absolute negativity is also then subject to that, meaning that my very notion of the horror of the trenches in that moment it's a trauma it is an absolute negativity because you're you're exposed to this other side of life in a way you know where the subject and object dichotomy falls apart and you're confronted with just this this happening which is um a torture in a way so the way and this is my and this is my interest in Zizek in in a way like it's my jouissance of Zizek is to say well the way that he sees the real is he's aware that I'm I'm always interpreting it. I'm always adding my own mediated idea towards it. And this is why he would use words like abyss, horror. So in this um, Hegel versus Heidegger, he talks about how Heidegger is too optimistic about what nothingness kind of signifies, because where nothingness is just annihilation, it's actually Heidegger who's not getting with the negativity. But Hegel does, because Hegel recognizes how language itself is a kind of torture house. I think he takes this from Lacan in the text, like it's a torture house of language, which just always seems to fail upon what? Upon the cracks, upon the gaps, upon the inconsistencies. Whereas my pleasure with Heidegger is he would say, ah, but if you then attempt to define what appears as negativity, you're forgetting that you too are determining it. So that's Heidegger's constant critique, is to always like question the it and the is of what seems to be negative or negativity, you know? Like in the sense that instead that's an openness or a clearing or a space in which we can interpret, you know? But of course, in the trenches, it's a horror. There's no denying, you know? There is a negativity to it. But I think what Zizek does, and I think this is what he sees as being like the topsy-turvy, contingent happening of all the world around him even in that topsy turviness he would actually say that there is just pure horror and that's my kind of criticism of his work in a sense because is he is he taking the radical radicality of heidegger seriously or even the feminology because if you say that negativity is the way it is it is a horror and we should overcome it in a way you're kind of presupposing presupposing the being of nothing as if nothing is like determinable 
as having a particular character to it, you know. Um, and again, this comes down. I think, I think that the just quickly. I think the example that Zizek uses for this specific situation with Heidegger and negativity involves um, the subjectivization of absolute negativity, like the interpretations of, um, uh, for example, Jews in the Holocaust. He gives yep. that that example, and that will we could connect the World War One example with the World War Two example of. Of, of concentration camps and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that, where Zizek's saying to Heidegger, he's like, because you're analyzing things from the perspective of Dasein without a subject, yep. that you're sort of saying that this is like sort of this, yeah, uh, industrial death process. But actually, if you go into like, for example, Viktor Frankl uh, mm -hmm. work in, in Meaning and the Holocaust, there is a authentic subjectivization of loss. It's like this confrontation with loss. And what do you make of, with this loss? Mm -hmm. Like, so Viktor Frankl, for example, like lost all of his notes, lost all of his book, you know, mm -hmm. he's like basically saying, you know, if I don't get out of here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose this forever. And this sort of authentic subjectivization process, which mm -hmm. is interesting, brings us into contact in some way with Heidegger's notion of authenticity in Dasein. Yep. Yeah, then I think because actually this is where my whole work is centering at the moment. Like, and even just thinking back to a conversation I had with Daniel like last month or two months ago, and it was like a really, and even the conference on the spoke Zarathustra is like an affirmation of this this element or characteristic of life as like a letting be, as an eros, as a love, you know. But of course, the, the work I tackle is always around this negativity as loss, as like you lose something, and the only way that I've come to understand it through Heidegger is. Um, and, and Nietzsche in a way, like, but then, but then it, this is, this is Zizek's actual actuality to use Hegel's word of actuality, you know, like the things that happen outside of kind of mediation in the sense of like, you're witnessing the real or the absolute negativity of what can happen. Whereas my reading is to say, well, actually <laughs> how, and maybe this is what you're interested in with the absolute concept as a way to mediate the state, you know, as a way to like force this awareness of even beingness of like to say, look, like, the, and this is okay, now I've clicked in some way. Loss always arrives, arrives or arises because we always live in that everyday consciousness of assuming that the object is there for us. So the loss that we feel is always around this idea of like, I'm losing something in this event. Like I am, my determination is breaking down. Of course, then if you think about the actual event of being in a trench and these explosions, of course, that's beyond your, oh, you thought it was an object. So like, oh, it's just your loss is just because it's an object, you know? It's like, no, like in that real, you're <laughs> really there. Like, fuck, like it's, you know? But, this is the question, and this is the radical, more radical question, is what leads to these situations in life where you're confronted with absolute negativity? And so Heidegger's critique of technology, even if he was a fascist, and he was part of this period where he could forget about subjectivity in the sense of being subjected by the state, the idea is the very dynamic of subject and object is that which imposes beings to relate to each other where there are these events of horror like these events of horror happen because we presuppose the other we presuppose the british nation we presuppose the german nation so these officers who live in this transcendental realm of obligation injunction like geopolitics is this in a way like geopolitics exists because everybody presupposes that it's happening and it's real and this Zizek gets with this actually a lot like the symbolic order is exists and it moves because we think it exists we think it's an object we think it's an other and it's because of this thinking towards it because we think it it is and this is heidegger's contribution we act as if it is but heidegger's annihilation is to constantly undo this towards a kind of quality of being where you wouldn't want to kill somebody because you see that they're not somebody to kill they're an event in themselves. They are a consciousness which is aware of their own being, you know, in some way. 
And I think this is what Heidegger is trying to point to. And I think Hegel and the feminology seems to point to. There is a quality of like a kind of unconditioned way of being, even just for a moment as an advent, to use Hegel's word, or an event, to use Heidegger's, where we encounter beingness as that which is certain. And I think this changes our relationship to politics. It changes our relationship to the other, you know. And I think this is what um, Zizek misses, actually. I think he misses the, what Heidegger is trying to point to is at least a moment in thinking which doesn't have to see language as a torture house. It doesn't have to presuppose a, a, an absolute negativity because it would say, yeah, that happens, like the events happen, but why? Because of what? In which way? You know? And of course, I'm, I'm heavily projecting here because it's a question for myself. Because if I'm talking about a different quality of knowing, a different quality of being in the world, and you confront the system that subjects you in a particular way, but then maybe this comes down to post-Heideggerian thinking, like deconstruction. Deconstruction is a kind of consequence of Heidegger's thinking where it's a, yeah, like this system is imposing um, or is subjecting, subjecting subjects. But the reason why it's doing so is because the reason why it exists is because we think it exists. So what, like this is such, like the, what we need to do is like radically rethink what it means to think the thing, you know, to undo and take away, to annihilate, to bring us back to like phenomena and that's phenomenology, like to bring us back to that different quality of thinking things. Whereas I think Zizek, this is again, to go back, Zizek too easily characterizes um, what appears to be as nothingness as a horror. Whereas I think from my own ideas, even around politics and like the, the, the changing of politics, the topsy turviness is like things only get better when we recognize that we don't have to call it a horror. Because that precept is like the um, Thomas Hobbesian idea, like, ah, oh, it's a state of nature, it's just a mess. We should shield ourselves from this. The idea is, well, what actually, if we recognize that we, there is a way of being which, you know, minimizes pain and violence what if there is a way of being which is opening us up to the absolute and its exhibition you know the absolute concept the absolute as a phenomenological experience of spirit meaning of experience yeah. and i think this again this is my i think this is what this is all heidegger wants to do i think so in language heidegger is just literally saying look let's question this is of what negativity seems to be because then what you'll catch is what Heidegger, Hegel, sorry, did catch with becoming, you know? Even my notion of absolute negativity maybe is also subject to becoming. And I think this actually goes back to our nihilism conversation. Like, I think Nietzsche does something very similar in some way. I'm just kind of playing with this degrounding, playing with this undoing. But mm. and maybe more recently, I've, I've had this idea of degrounding and taking away, not towards nothingness but towards a different quality of living of being like Nietzsche's life affirmation maybe starts at that same point of like okay it's here that we can affirm life right because life even well, the negativity of life changes into the rapture of the open space you know well it's it's interesting i mean these these problems do have practical historical dimensions to them because you know when you emphasize deconstruction as a consequence of heidegger's thinking i mean it's it's hard it's hard for me to imagine, for example, the state being able to enlist eighteen year old guys in the way that they did in World War One and World War Two. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be less of a sort of um, you know let's say culture or system of thought which uh, mm -hmm. would recognize that form of subject uh, being subjected to uh, the absolute negativity. There's a, a and at the same time, it seems like subjects sort of freed from that subjugation um, uh, still find themselves in weird situations of confronting a, a, a sort of absolute negativity, which doesn't seem historically conditioned in the sense of mm -hmm. um, perhaps our, I don't know if, if Heidegger would frame this in terms of our transcendental finitude, but there's mm -hmm. this way in which the condition of being human is is itself one which lends itself to um death and confrontation with death a being towards death and i mm -hmm. guess like that would be my question here which would be interesting to explore is um 
you know, Hegel starts the science of logic by basically saying that from the standpoint of knowing which he's trying to think from, it literally doesn't matter whether you're alive or dead. Like whether you are or are, are like, so like mm -hmm. Shakespeare would say something like to be or not to be, that is the question. Mm -hmm. Where I think Hegel's saying something like to be or not to be is not a question for absolute mm -hmm. knowing. Yep. Like you are and you are not, and <laughs> and, I was saying, and so mm -hmm. yeah. What, what are what what ideas come to you in relationship to that thought and being towards death and also the historical ways in which we mm -hmm. subjectivize or interpret this death? What we're willing to subject, what we're willing to subjugate ourselves towards, what we're not mm -hmm. willing to subjugate ourselves towards, and things like this. Um, mm -hmm. it, I think, and this will be leading, but. I think what it leads us towards is an understanding of um, enjoyment. Like what, how do we negotiate with limit to the mm -hmm. left or with the ultimate limit being death? Um, how do we negotiate with limit in such a way as that we do enjoy, mm -hmm. can enjoy? Mm hmm Yeah. And maybe I think Heidi was, and even what was I reading with this? Where Heidegger was talking about the Greeks, the Greeks were always, in a way, like aware of excess, always aware of like the fact that even even with Plato and Socrates, you have like the object of knowledge. That an object of knowledge only ever appears within appearance. You know, it only ever appears within the excess of appearance. So there's the enjoyment is the appearance with the knowing of the thing itself. So the excess was always there, you know, it was always already there. Um, my, just to go back to what you said, like the, this, this thing, like with what Hegel was saying, like it's not even to, to be about to be or not to be, because I think there's the same thrust of knowing, of absolute knowing, which kind of negates even being a nothing, you know? I think this is why he moves to this idea of becoming. But becoming is for Heidegger Hegel's being in that sense like of course it's moved away from being but becoming is the kind of event which Heidegger loves to get with which is this event that just kind of even does undoes these ideas of nothingness and beingness like it takes it away towards the subject as self-conscious as certain of its own being <laughs> Of its own being you know like and this this play and i think i'm i'm, I'm obsessed with this and I, I, li I like when i see this in heidegger and hegel you know like to think to think this ongoingness to think this um experience of consciousness for hegel and this opening or disclosure to the beingness of being for heidegger i think it's at this point that even and i think this is again why Heidegger stopped talking about finitude or the transcendental, you know, concept of finitude, which is always there as the future thing to provoke you. I think because he also then understood that what annihilation comes to mean is that even your idea of death, even your projection towards death, like he doesn't want to make death a being in the sense of he doesn't want it to be a, a type of being which can be determined in its essence in that sense. He wants it to be undone to the experience of phenomena, happening, beingness, where you're still aware that you won't be like this one day, but the very weight of death, it kind of dissipates. And that's when you have this relationship in a way. So it, it's not like a correct comportment. It's like a distillation. It's like an undoing towards. Yeah just the openness of being. And again, like this, this is why truth doesn't disappear from Heidegger. This is why truth doesn't disappear from Hegel. Because even in the undoing, what remains? It brought to see more of it. Like it still moves of itself, you know? But what moves? That's the question, I think. Beingness, consciousness. And then, and this, this is my enjoyment, I think it's at this point when you realize it's not about to be or not to be, it's about becoming then you're free to think in a different quality other than everyday consciousness because you're not trying to label everything as if it has a truth in itself, you know? You're not trying to label death as if it has a truth in itself. See, you live this thoroughgoing skepticism, but it doesn't mean that life stops. It just means you have a different relationship to things, you know?
two people, well, I, two places. I, I think here it would be interesting to bring in psychoanalysis and Lacan more explicitly because it seems to me in my reading of it is when we ask the question, you know, when you say, for example, truth doesn't disappear, truth moves of itself, but what moves? I think that Lacan's answer to that will be libido. So like what moves is libido. So like, like, and that, that this has been, and, and this, I guess, like I would even go so far as to say perhaps that what Lacan is getting at in a Heideggerian sense is that what has been concealed of being since Socrates is libido. Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense to me. What's your first contact with that idea or, or have yeah. you thought about that idea? Yeah, yeah. Like this, like when you mentioned this, there's kind of a Heideggerian skepticism that creeps in to say, well, that's the point. So whatever we call this thing is how we've understood being in our own way, you know? So if we use the word libido, drive, if we say love, if we say, you know, we're talking about the quality of beingness, yeah? We're talking about like what was being concealed, what hasn't been concealed. So my initial skepticism is like, okay, so when we determine this idea of like libido, are we ontologizing it? Are we making it like the essential determination of being, you know? So like Schopenhauer and like the drive, the will, you know? But like the and this this incessant horror. So again, this is my criticism of Zizek. Like how are we characterizing what we're calling being? And this is my point. Like I, I like this idea of risking characterizing what we're calling being like that which has been unconcealed you know and this is why we can't escape our own idea of what is in that sense but the question is like now with psychoanalysis are we talking to something which is phenomenologically present in the sense that we catch it happening of itself because of course we catch libido desire excess you know hunger we catch it of itself and this is why like both heideggerian thinking and hegelian is a turn to feminology in some sense. It's a turn to experience as, not like as a system of knowing in the sense of like, oh, empiricism or rationalism. It's a turn to experience in the sense of being aware of that I am moving <laughs> without my dictation, without my conceptualization, without my determination. And so the I am then is being like, who am I to be moved? Like what is the quality of my being that's moving of itself and this is when you find heidegger's drawing towards this point like you just said so for psychoanalysis it's libido it's that which has been concealed since you know Socrates well, the or... central the central concept in in less than nothing which is sort of like sort of my anyway foundation touch point with, with Zizek's work is mm -hmm. you know he was actually going to he was debating whether to call less than nothing less than nothing or eper si muave which means mm -hmm. and yet it moves Mm -hmm. And he opens it up, you know, he opens up the introduction. He ends up just title, titling the introduction, Aper si Moave, but this is, and yet it, and yet it moves. So it seems like to me, no matter what post Hegelian philosopher we turn to, and I sort of have mentioned this in the course already, it seems to me, no matter what post Hegelian philosopher we turn to, I mean, I could think of many, 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 but the idea of this movement, the idea of this becoming which is sort of independent of me in some ordinary classical sense is um, what we're trying to, I don't know, think, work with, uh, become with, uh, are, uh, you know. Uh, and, this, and this is Heidegger's own jouissance with Hegel. Like if you, read, if you read this Hegel's concept of experience, you can just see like, it's so easy for Heidegger to say the absolute is being. Like the being that Heidegger has been working with for years and years, he says like, yeah, actually <laughs> Hegel arrives at beingness in exactly the same way that Heidegger wanted to, meaning being skeptical about everyday thinking, which just assumes things are objects, deconstructing, annihilating, having this thoroughgoing skepticism towards this moment of, oh, it's happening. It's moving of itself. It, it's, it's presenting itself in its presence, you know? So like the way that Heidegger reads Hegel is that what absolute knowing is, is the very fact that our representation presents its own happening to itself. That's what self-consciousness is. 
Like I can think the very fact that I am conscious, that I am thinking. Because that type of representation, that type of mediation catches something which is not just an object at hand that dies and changes. It changes, but in a sense that it becomes, but there's always just this cognizance of like, oh, <laughs> I'm the one who's thinking this. Even if this fails, the I am thinking of this is happening. And that's the point. That's, that's the place that I think they get to, that Shizek gets to. And then I think it's, it's really open then to say, well, how is that experienced? How does the absolute pre present itself to you? How does being present itself to you? So Heidegger's optimism that Zizek critiques is that being presents itself as a releasement, as a letting be, as a letting of presence. It's what allows presence to make itself present for us. Like being is the gap of allowance in some way of opening and that's that's enough to then see life in its affirmation because you're like oh god like that's nice you know but then you see the horror of the event creeping and you're like what happened about that moment in the trenches with the you know this raw crudity how is that possible if i see life as being an opening or a letting be or a, you know a making way a releasement heidegger would say well that's just modern technological thinking thinking that there are objects that can be destroyed and manipulated and used, like people in a war, you know. Whereas Zizek would maybe then, and this is my kind of criticism, he would really overly determine being as being an absolute negativity without even being aware that in saying this, he's kind of remaining within natural consciousness in some way because he's presupposing that the truth of being is a bad quality even because of course that happens in history like you said in history that occurs the being appears in its negativity but the heideggerian question is why in which form is it because it's been unconcealed in its negativity or is or or because mm -hmm. being was actually not present in that moment as a you know as a grace or a love or well it seems like Zizek's at least in the article that's orienting our conversation it, it seems like Zizek's response to the absolute negativity doesn't just stop there, but goes to the idea of the real of jouissance. And yep. he says, the, like, the real, of joui the real of jouissance, and he, he even said, and obviously he's connecting it to libido, he's connecting it to um, the subject's experience of libido, um, and, uh, you know, the, what he calls the vicissitudes. Um, and mm. he's saying that the, the, the sort of proper mode of response to this condition is um, uh, to not just simply accept a certain linguistic horizon, but to, um, as it were, torture the language we're in. And he mm -hmm. calls, you know, the, the difference between Heidegger saying we live in a, a, a house of language mm -hmm. uh, versus a torture house of language. And mm -hmm. the idea here is well, at least as Zizek's presenting it is, he sees the name for torturing language as poetry. That mm -hmm. poetry is the best way to torture language and to make a sort of positive, a positive, a positive advance um, in our conceptualizations through contradictions. And the idea that I want to throw out here, because it's something I'm thinking about more and more and it seems that it needs more and more thought, is that not only does psychoanalysis as a historicization of dealing with libido try to play with free association, sort of play with more um, uh, open connections and stuff of language, but mm -hmm. like I would say hip hop. So like hip hop as a modern phenomenon is one, it's originating in a specifically historically conditioned absolute negativity. Let's say like segregation, uh, racial discrimination and, and so forth. And, and hip hop as a mode of poetry is in some sense um, torturing language and mm -hmm. not, you know, and, and, and torturing language in a very creative way in so mm -hmm. far as that it moves the discourse forward. There's a sort of sublation that occurs in hip hop because even the language, which was sort of just very niche and very subcultural and very unique to one particular scene, 
then mm-hmm. becomes universalized. Like the language of hip hop becomes spread throughout the entire culture and even the entire planet now as the most dominant form of music. So it's like, mm-hmm. what's going on there? And it seems to me that's an interesting point of consideration. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, because again, you're bringing in this kind of optimism that I think Shushek also has, like, how can we re if, if language is the torture house of being, you know, like, we just notice gaps and inconsistencies and emotivity, can we as human beings who go through the process of like self-analyzing, psychoanalyzing, can we play with those aspects of language that seem to like conceal the beauty of life, you know? How can we do this? And I think Daniel Garner from OG Rose, he had this conversation, he had this conversation and he kept talking about scythering and hip hop as like the open space where you just use these words that seem to be like trivializing and torturing. You can know, like, you know this in a very like being way in the sense that you just play with it anyway and you see this massive different quality just appear through the torture, you know, through the absolute negativity, through this like determination of it is them, you know, like you see this breakdown towards what? Towards the beingness itself. Um, Yeah. And this, this is, and I think this is, this is the consequence of Heidegger, Hegel and contemporary interpretations. I think it just brings you to this negativity, which enables you to maybe risk characterizing things again. And I think this is the joy of philosophy, like even if it's just full of repetition, each repetition opens up a new way to speak in language about the same themes and maybe bringing with it a new kind of awareness of libido, awareness of jouissance, awareness of enjoyment, awareness of an excess that escapes my idea of it. But it depends like what we what kind of excess are we pointing to? Because of course, like we we experience different modes of excess in life, like positive excess, negative excess, you know, an excess which can't even be determined as positive or negative. But how do in a way, like in like the utilitarian perspective, how do we maximize that political real which rather than enjoying and this is Zizek's whole critique of ideology, like what is the real of a political system that it falls back onto, you know? This is why he does affirm different modes of systems because he wants to say, well, the shape of the system in today's historical epoch has the potential to open up different ways of thinking or to minimize certain aspects of subjectivization, you know? Because even if it's all illusory or maybe not that word, even if it is always torturing, maybe we can think about different qualities of torture in that sense, you know, <laughs> like different ways of working within language to open up different modes, you know, because even if it is torturing, even if it's illusory and it's torturing, it still has an effect. I mean, I think, I think my history with my YouTube channel is a sort of torturing of language as it relates to the university system. Mm-hmm. Like I think, okay. I think, I think it's, 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 it's interesting to think in this way. Now, I want to, I, I, just based on what you're saying, I, I, I want to bring this, I'll first make a quick point. I want to bring this back to the idea that perhaps what's going on in the Socratic period mm-hmm. that Heidegger's saying is a concealment of a sort of ecstasy, to me, it's interesting to think about that in a Freudian lens. Because in a Freudian lens, like civilization and its discontents, he's basically saying that civilization only functions based on a repression of ecstasy, a repression Mm -hmm. of libido, and Mm -hmm. a sublimation of libido uh, towards civilizing activities, which have paradoxical qualities of being both um, higher order and in some sense lower order in terms of like the brutality of a World War One or the brutality of a World War Two. So, you know, it's obviously both the higher uh, positive qualities of, of civilization that could never have happened without that sort of, mm-hmm. let's say, concealment or repression or sublimation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also sort of new levels of horrors that we could have never had without that either, like new, like mass institute, like a, uh, industrialized violence and 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 I think that's often left out of narratives of technological singularity for example where like figures like Kurzweil will say 
you know, there's going to be this positive utopian, you know, uh, immortality or, or, or transcendence of the human condition without the sort of recognition that there could be all new levels of horrors like eternal torture or, you know, like you're tortured. You know what I mean? Like it's like all sorts of uh, horrors come up and possibilities that could never have happened otherwise. But the yeah. last, one of the last questions I'd like to ask you, and uh, you could also just respond to, to what I was saying there if you want to, but like one of the mm -hmm. last questions I wanted to ask is, it seems to me like a lot's at stake in the difference between interpreting as design and interpreting as subject. Mm -hmm. And like, what do you, how do you make sense of the difference between design and subject? Do you mm -hmm. feel that there's still need for subject or do you feel like, um, you know, how, yeah. How do you make sense of this difference? Mm -hmm. I understand like my, so I think in this 1968 seminar, he says, um, cause where he, this, and he gives like a critique of being in time, but he says the one thing that being in time wanted to move away from was kind of this idea of the modern idea of subject and object, what he would call like the prison of consciousness in a way. Because he would say modern thought is always based upon this idea of positing, which means positioning. So with Kant, or with Descartes, but developed in Kant, there was the idea that was really ingrained at that point of, I am the thinker, which in experiencing anything happening, is always experiencing it through mediation, you know? It's for me. Like, it's for me, not for you. And your way is for you. And then, you know, there's always a difference of the singularity in each perspective. Everything becomes particular. Like, in a way, Heidegger's whole work is working through this modern thinking to say, well, how within mediation do we think this excess or think this being, you know? But I think what Heidegger only, Heidegger's highest affirmation, his kind of conservatism, is in a way kind of a bit pre-modern in the sense that he says well the reason why we can't talk about subject and object or we can but we have to think kind of post subject and object in the way that hegel does is to recognize that even my determination of subject and object presupposes too much but what heidegger does presuppose too much in a way is the Greek thinking, like the Heraclitus thinking, or even the early Platonic thinking, which is to say, well, I'm experiencing or open to a being in front of me. That is enough for Heidegger, just to be aware that there is a being outside of a subject-object relationship. There's what he calls like a transappropriation. There's like a, a phenomenological experience of phenomena as it presents itself to me. Then, of course, he would introduce mediation, subject, object. He would introduce this problem of modern thinking because he's tackling this, you know. But what he always wants to bring us back to is literally that sign. There it is. It is there. You know, like he wants to bring us to that type of experience, which is not trying to do what Socrates ended up doing, which is like determine the in itself. He wants to say that what there is in front of us is its truth. Because what is there is unconcealed for us. Then there's the question of like, well, does that mean that any idea I have of it, like my idea of you, is always relative to my position? It's always contingent based upon my historical happening, you know? But like within that type of thinking, which is subject and object, you know, like this, like the subject of the system also subjects me because it thinks I'm just there for labor or something, you know? So in that dynamic, which is effective, it's happening, is there a way to see the beingness of a being which is literally just present for me or let be for me? You know, and I think this is this is the distinction. So in a way, it's like being aware of the subject-object relation, which Heidegger is, because that's his whole obsession with technological thinking, you know? He would say it works in that relation, which is why the work on singularity is very interesting, because it's like... <laughs> That itself is destroying the subject and object relation itself, you know. And that's uh, Zizek's book, Hegel in a Wide Brain, is very interesting because even there, Zizek would say, well, there is an excess to the singularity, you know. So Heidegger is concerned with this excess, I think. So he says, yeah, subject and object, te technological thinking, but is there a way to think through representation 
But even then he would criticize the word representation because that's a very modern idea. Is that you're presented with something and then you cognize it. I think his kind of nihilation wants to even um, undo the distance between things in a way. And it's very mystical in that sense. So his text, I think, what is called thinking, uses the word gathering to say that actually what thinking can do, uh, even building, dwelling, thinking. He says like you have a bridge in a field that's at a distance. Like apart from like its distance is like a physical actual distance, that bridge in your thinking of it, in the type of thinking that he wants, he would say that actually if you let that bridge be, it gathers from afar everything, you know, it gathers the world around, it gathers the sky, it gathers the divinities, just in your comprehension of it. So you're not looking at it as if it's like an object that has an in itself quality. You're looking at the phenomenon of a bridge to look at the history that made that bridge, the fact that it brings like from one side of the river, you can then cross and it brings with it all of these relative moments of thinking. The bridge for Heidegger, it becomes more open and let be. So even if it's always my impression of it, the presentation of the bridge to me does something and he's concerned with the does something, even if it's relative. Because he would say the fact that that bridge does something is the truth. It's unconcealment to you is the truth. And I think from Heidegger's reading of Hegel, Hegel does the same with absoluteness. What's true about beings is their own, you know, becoming. Yeah, I think it might be worthwhile to touch for a moment on, you know, your emphasis here that Heidegger is trying to, you know, destroy the subject object relation, the difference between things and our representation of things. You know, one of the things that comes up in 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 Zizek's uh, Hegel in a wired brain is he says mm -hmm. that the idea of a wired brain is meant to totally get rid in the type of mystical union, almost this. Um, difference between my thinking and the things, mm -hmm. in the sense that in a in, in the sense of a, in a in a in a, wi in a wired brain there'd be no more gap that would constitute my desire, mm -hmm. because the difference between me and the things is is one, mm -hmm. uh, and and so you just enter this sort of like you know like sort of a phantasmatic virtual reality space like if we had a like i was talking about this with someone else recently where you know if we had if if this external computation was minimized and implanted into our brains and we were just having this conversation in some sort of shared virtual space where perhaps mm -hmm. we'd have all of our senses sim simulated and we could hug each other or we could shake each other's hand or you know i could feel your hair you could you know we you know you could smell each other you know, mm -hmm. like that, that this would be a sort of collapse of the, it would be like a literal collapse of the gap between the mm -hmm. two. But Zizek sort of presents this as a potential nightmare. Mm -hmm. So he sees the, the, again, he's trying to bring the negativity into the technological singularity visions of like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could directly share each other's minds? He's like, no, what if that would be the ultimate nightmare? Like no. and 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 this collapse of the gap is actually not freedom but slavery, like mm -hmm. that when we we all merge our brains into like a a, a wired brain, mm -hmm. a global brain. Like my PhD thesis is titled "Global Brain Singularity." Mm -hmm. You know, what if that is actually slavery, and that freedom depends on keeping a minimal distance, keeping a gap, keeping true to the absolute negativity of the mm -hmm. mediation of the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. I think because my because when I read this book the other year, it was very nice because it was kind of an affirmation of what I see in Heidegger in a sense of like exactly. So when you reach singularity, there is still an excess, you know. Like there's still the being which is there with the chip inside. There is still that which can't be understood with technological language, which is then also technology itself. And it's the very excess of being in that sense, you know, it's the very excess of nothing in that sense. Or in the Hegelian sense, it's the very excess of becoming. Because even the singularity is subject to becoming. You know, and like that's that's the movement still. Like that's the absolute negativity that I would be a bit skeptical to say it's absolute negativity. I would just say it's the openness which allows for that to be possible. Like, so even if subject and object is brought together and I can think things in immediacy and do things without even having to consider the object, 
I am still a being that's being, and that's like the excess in my interpretation. And I think I think Shujek does a nice job where he can kind of compares this to the unconscious as well. You know, like the unconscious is a good symbol for that excess, which outside of the signification, which is like one to ten connected. There's always that libido to go back to what we said before that just moves of itself, you know, the hunger, <laughs> you know. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so there, there's 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 a uh, there was a talk by by Osho, who's a, I'm not sure if you know him, but he's an Indian mystic, mm -hmm. and he sort of says that lack or negativity for ordinary consciousness is actually spaciousness or openness for mm. i guess he would say an enlightened consciousness so there's this idea that negativity from one perspective is spaciousness from another side or lack from one perspective is openness from another side mm. um and i just want to make a weird connection here and maybe see what you think about it it's very speculative thinking is in modern physics these are very speculative papers but there's obviously the idea of a black hole, which is an absolute negativity. Like mm -hmm. it's just like a monster Structure. which consumes all the particular matter. Mm -hmm. And then there's this speculative idea of a white hole, which is the opposite of a black hole, which mm -hmm. of, although speculative could be the place where universes are born. Like mm -hmm. they come out of a white hole, like the Big Bang is like a white hole. Mm -hmm. So there's this idea that like to use Osho's language, negativity or lack on one side is openness mm -hmm. or, or spaciousness on another side is mm -hmm. what's your first uh, encounter or thought here as this relation? Mm, first encounters Hegel when he talks about the null and nullity of what seems to be apparent to natural consciousness. So when there's this kind of, yeah, inconsistency, contradiction, failure for natural consciousness, the only thing it turns to is nothingness like determinate nothingness. It thinks that, okay, well, that's it then. That's what's left over. It's just nothingness. It's just nullity. It's just void. It's just lack in that sense, you know? And I think this is what nihilism is. It's that nihilism which just remains upon its own natural consciousness because it thinks what is, is nothing. And it stops because it can't move. It's trapped. And even Hegel talks about this kind of, uh, to what use the word that we say, emotivity of that moment. It's like, oh, like what? <laughs> what can I do? How can I think the truth of anything, if I recognize the truth of that thing, it just falls back onto nothingness. But it's at that point that you see how your idea of the nothingness is itself mediated, interpreted, or Hegel's word, determined. So I think that, that's my understanding. Like he moves from determinate nothingness, which is nihilism, or unaccomplished nihilism, to use Nietzsche's word, to determinate negation which is to recognize that even nothingness is in the state of becoming or your idea of it's yeah. in a state of becoming. I just want to make a quick point that when Hegel brings up the concept of determinate negation, not only does he try to emphasize that that's a key concept for his system, but it's also the place where nihilism does not, uh, or nothingness does not result in a pure nihilism or nothingness does not result in a pure null result. It's actually the place of the positivity. Exactly. Yeah, because things still move in that place. And I think this is the whole movement yeah, of my yeah, own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nihilism and postmodernity, which is my main supervisor's whole thing. Um, my whole crit critique of this, this world, this sphere, is to say, well, what you're calling nothingness and which all of the problems then arise from, that nothingness is presupposed in some sense. The same as way, like in my idea of at the moment of Shijek's abyss, or horror, it, it's presupposed. And of course, there's a reason for presupposition because of experience, my own ideas, you know? Like if you've lived a really shit life, like of course you're gonna see nothingness is probably what there is because you don't see anything move apart from the horror or negativity. But, and this is the point, I think in the experience of what Hegel would call true consciousness, you find that what is continuing to be in nothingness beingness itself is a kind of becoming which has truth or absoluteness or certainty so nihilism is the lack of certainty concerning anything i think with hegel and with heidegger and with others and even nietzsche i would say 
you encounter a kind of absoluteness of life itself in Nietzsche's terms, you know, in the sense that life is the ecstasy which is happening of itself. Of course, there's horror. Of course, there are moments of trauma. Of course, there's like the topsy-turviness. But within all of the topsy-turviness, you know, there's um, a certainty of the very fact that that's happening of itself. And then that opens it up to the possibility that it could be a white hole instead of a black hole or both together, you know. But maybe the white hole can be <laughs> drawn towards, like if we had a choice to go there, I think we'd rather go there, maybe. I don't know, but, you know. Yeah, it's and it's interesting. Dressing. I just 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 want to make a quick note to you and and the viewers that the World War One movie I was referencing earlier is called All Quiet on the on the Western Front. Of course, that was a it's a it, it, and now I realize it was it's such a good movie because it was a book adaptation. Okay. But yeah, All Quiet on the Western Front is a famous uh, famous book. But um, I guess I guess to 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 close down the the conversation there. I mean, we had we had a conversation on 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 nihilism. Uh, actually, over overcoming nihilism there in the Nietzsche uh, dialogues, um, and your doctoral thesis uh, focuses on nihilism as well. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you know where do you think you know we we sort of got to recommend people go check out the the talk we had on uh, overcoming nihilism if you're interested in on his take in relationship to Nietzsche. Where do you think Heidegger and Hegel fall uh, here in terms of both your work? Um, uh, on, on nihilism in your doctorate and mm -hmm. perhaps also, you know, in your own, in your own life, you know? Yeah, that's the best question because it's actually why I'm also been, I've been drawn to like Hegel's, uh, Heidegger's Hegel. And even the last four, five, six months, even doing the Nietzsche conference, you know, like the, the presentation I gave there was like an affirmation of this quality of a possible determination of being, which was really affirmative, you know? Whereas like before this, it's like working through nihilism, through Vatimo and Zizek, which is like, oh, look at the condition we're in. Like, how can we even begin to think in this condition, you know, which is a lot more um, pessimistic concerning what nothingness comes to mean or even what becoming comes to mean. I think for anyone here that wants to check it out, like look at Heidegger's text, Hegel's concept of experience and read his commentary when he talks about um, but the moment when Hegel talks about like the breakdown of natural consciousness, where it approaches a kind of skepticism, because Hegel would say that it's a short term skepticism, which just keeps repeatedly sticking to no nothingness, you know, and then it thinks that that is what there is. And that is our condition today in nihilism. Like we think that there is just no thing because God is dead. I can't determine anything because I recognize it's an interpretation, which has its truth, you know. But, but the, 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 the deepest joy of Heidegger and Hegel is they can think through nothingness in an undogmatic way, a way that Zizek and I would say Vatimo seem to kind of also get a bit stuck on, which is why I think Zizek does talk about the horror in such an easy way, you know, because he is also like determining the lack as just nothingness, like, oh, I think there's more room to be more skeptical, to follow what Hegel calls a thoroughgoing skepticism, which sees how, well, maybe instead of nothingness, it's just an open space which takes away. But so the question is, what is it taking away? For Heidegger, it's taking away a type of consciousness, to use Hegel's term, a type of knowing, a type of a mode of being, which is obsessed with objects and, and knowing beings in themselves. Because maybe that's the problem. There were never any beings to be known in the way that we've tried to know them. The truth or certainty or absoluteness of life is its happening. The beingness that when we look around the room and we see the cupboard, it's the presentation of the of the cupboard, you know, it's the 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 more manifold aspect, not the one sided aspect that we try to know through, you know, just a name or something, a signifier. Because then there will always be a lack. So yeah, it's very interesting. Like, and this is and even now, like Heidegger's Hegel is really something I'm working through and will work through until, not until, you know, it's like it's really opened up the more curious elements of how we can think through uh, different qualities of being. Because I, I, in my own experience, I think there are different qualities of being. Even if I'm not always living that quality, I'm aware of moments which show me that 
the possibility of human beings living that quality is there you know mm -hmm. and then it's interesting because then it relates to what you said like the real of politics like how how can we play with what seems to be absolute negativity in the sense that we bring a different quality even into that world you know even into mm -hmm. the other the social symbolic you know mm -hmm. yeah so, okay yeah no it's 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 interesting so i think here if i could just maybe offer um a brief a brief synopsis of what we've discussed here thomas and i have been discussing, you know, I think is a continuation of our talk on overcoming nihilism a little bit, but, you know, there's this emphasis on, you know, first, you know, the origin of Heidegger's project, the history of the question of being. Mm -hmm. um, there's the way in which Hegel himself introduces being as the starting point of his philosophy and there's the initial reaction to Hegel as um, perhaps participating in this, what Heidegger would call a um, concealment of being uh, in sort of monstrous conceptualization or monstrous systematization. You know, we got into a little bit about the difference between sublation and annihilation in Heidegger and Hegel. We got into um, the way in which Heidegger and Hegel interpret negativity. Um, you know, whether that's the centrality of negativity, different interpretations of it, uh, different ways in which Heidegger and Hegel um, maybe interpret language, uh, conditions of being in language, get into a little bit of Zizek, uh, negativity, jouissance, and, and so forth. And, um, you know, I think I'd just wrap up by saying here that this is just sort of a, an opening, you know, discursive taste of the types of things that Thomas will be, you know, formally presenting on a, a sort of giving us a, a clearer picture of Heidegger's Hegel in uh, the end of the Science of Logic course there. So links in the description to that if you're interested. Uh, late registration still open. Uh, and we're just going to be getting into the core of the book in February, starting on Monday. So now's the time, I suppose, to jump in. Um, and I guess uh, any any final words from you, Thomas, on uh, you know what you're what you're up to? No, I would just say it's um, it's really a trip to read through Heidegger's Hegel. Like it's really mm -hmm. um, phenomenal. Like in the sense that both point to phenomena, and they they do it in a way which isn't dogmatic. They're not just saying, okay, this is the immediacy of what is, and congratulations, you've arrived. It's, there's a particular yeah. quality of thinking phenomena as it's being, yeah. which in a way gets with the thing that nihilism doesn't get with, which is a kind of absoluteness. Because for nihilism, absoluteness is like, oh, the last thing it can think about, but only because it thinks of absoluteness in the same way which led to nothingness. So I think the present, the, the, the lecture that will be given will be, yeah, a really formal understanding of the overlap, Heidegger's criticism, and of how that opens up Heidegger himself in his ability to read the Hegel that we can read today through the likes of Zizek. And from what I've already read and taken notes with and actually written out, Zizek himself can be criticized in his reading of Heidegger because he reads in Heidegger this like kind of modern optimism that just wants to arrive at the past enjoyment of the being, you know? Whereas I would say both, I would, and this is my affirmation from the feminology to Heidegger, they follow the exact same route towards beingness, which is different from being for Heidegger, but it's still the place where being really exposes itself, you know? Mm -hmm. So both arrive at beingness in a very, very critical way. And I think in, in that sense, it's enough, because actually, if you look at the literature on these two, like, they just normally compare their ideas of history or their ideas of, you know, so there's a lot to delve into, really a lot. It's very... Um, it's nice to encounter modern philosophers that still have so many rich overlaps and themes, you know. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. So it's uh, it's been a pleasure, Thomas. I'm just going to close up here. So for all of you guys watching, thanks for tuning in. This has been Heidegger's Hegel with Thomas Wynn, and we're out. <laughs>